This video is brought to you by, well, all of you. Thank you to my patrons for supporting the channel and making these videos possible. Al Muqaddimah is funded only by Patreon and as you can see, the videos take a long time to research, edit and produce. It's only because of my patrons that I can put this kind of time into these videos and keep them free from any kind of paywall. So if you want to pledge a dollar or more to support the channel, you can head over to my Patreon. The link is in the description. You can also become a member right here on YouTube. There are no benefits attached to it because I don't get the time to work on them. So if you want to support Al Muqaddimah financially, please go ahead. Otherwise, just like, comment, share, and subscribe. That's also supporting Al Muqaddimah. Hi, welcome to Al Muqaddimah. My name is Siavish. There was this 8th century historian who wrote about a man who existed in the previous century, the 7th century CE. He tells the story of a humble man whose life was changed forever by a remarkable dream slash vision. This man, who lived in a remote area far from the centers of civilization, was destined to become famous. His modest existence, unaffected by the might of the Roman Empire, was largely uneventful. Because of his community's trust, they frequently entrusted him with their animals. Despite his quiet nature and lack of formal education, he was respected by his community. One night, everything changed. Alone and far from the city's noise and hustle, he fell into a deep sleep. In his dream, an angel appeared, commanding him to share God's glory and the beauty of his creation with his people. He initially resisted and said, I cannot, but the angel was persistent, and upon waking, the man found that he was miraculously able to fulfill his divine mission. He began to speak about God and his creation in his people's language, doing so with um, an unmatched eloquence. The learned men in his community, hearing these divine words in their language, were amazed and convinced that it was a miracle. Now, based on this description, if you're familiar with the biography of the Prophet Muhammad, you'll probably think that this is actually his story. The story of the first revelation, of course. But it's not. It's the story of Cademan, a cattle herder from the Northumbrian marshes in the British Isles, who was one of the first to compose divine hymns in the Anglo-Saxon language. His story is written by the Venerable Bede in the Ecclesiastical History of the English People in 731 CE, almost exactly a century after the death of the Prophet Muhammad. But you wouldn't be wrong to think that this story is about Prophet Muhammad. It shares a lot of the plot points with his story. So how is it possible that these two stories, written a few decades and more than 5,000 miles apart, could be so similar? Is this a case of mere plagiarism or is there something more at play here? First, let me start by telling you both stories so that you can see their similarities. For simplicity's sake, let's call the story of the Prophet Muhammad the Iqra narrative and the story of Cademan, Cademan's call. I'm going to put them both side by side here so you can pause and read the whole thing if you want, but I'll just go through the major plot points. Bede begins the story of Cademan by establishing that Cademan used to compose poetry in his native tongue, which he learned not from men but from God. This is a common theme in Islam as well because a large portion of the Quran is indeed poetry in Arabic. However, while Bede says that Cademan composed poetry himself, Muslims don't believe that Prophet Muhammad wrote the Quran. We simply believe that he was the messenger of Allah, while the message, in this case the Quran, was composed by God himself. Now then, Bede goes on to tell the story of how Cademan learned his craft. We don't get the exact dates, but it seems that Cademan's vision occurred sometime between 657 and 680 CE, at which time he lived at the monastery of Streonashach. I hope that's how it's pronounced where he took care of the animals from time to time. He couldn't sing, and whenever he would be at a feast where people would be singing, he would leave. On one such occasion, he leaves and goes to sleep in the cattle barn, where he has a dream. 
According to Ibn Ishaq, Prophet Muhammad used to retreat for a month to one of the mountains near Mecca as an act of pious devotion. It was one of these retreats in the month of Ramadan that Allah ennobled him to prophethood. He also had a dream. Now notice that in both cases, the main figure is having a dream. There are other versions of the Iqra narrative where the Prophet wasn't asleep, but we'll stick to only this version by Ibn Ishaq. I'll explain the reasoning behind that in a minute. Notice that Ibn Ishaq doesn't actually say that it was a dream. In his version, it's mentioned that the Prophet was asleep when the angel came, but then the Prophet says that he woke up from sleep after the whole incident was done. So it's implied that it was a dream, whereas other versions explicitly mention that it was indeed a dream. Both Kaidman and Prophet Muhammad see a figure who calls out to them. Kaidman's visitor says to him, sing me something, to which Kaidman says, I cannot sing. The visitor says, nonetheless, you must sing to me. Kaidman asks, what must I sing? Sing, the visitor says, about the beginning of created things. And Kaidman begins to sing verses that he hadn't heard before in the praise of God, the Creator. Then Kaidman wakes up and he remembers it all. On the other side, Prophet Muhammad is clearly visited by the angel Gabriel, and the narrative is told in first person by Prophet Muhammad himself. The angel, in this case, is holding a sheet of silk that something is written on. Read, the angel says to which the Prophet says, I cannot read. The angel then presses against the Prophet, releases him and says again, read, to which the Prophet replies, what shall I read? The angel then says, read, read in the name of your Lord who did create, did create humanity from coagulate. The Prophet recites this and the angel leaves and when the Prophet wakes up, he remembers it all. Notice that in both versions, the visitor talks about God as the creator. While Kaidman's visitor only says, sing about the beginning of created things, the angel Gabriel tells the prophet directly to read in the name of your Lord who created. By the way, the word read is actually Iqra in Arabic. That's why we're calling this the Iqra narrative. According to the Islamic tradition, this was actually the first revelation of the Quran and forms the first five verses of the 96th chapter or surah of the Quran. Kaidman then goes to the abbess who takes him to the other learned men of the abbey who confirm that the Lord has granted him heavenly grace. The same thing happens with Prophet Muhammad. He goes to his wife, Khadija, who goes to a learned Christian cousin of hers, who tells her that he was visited by the angel Gabriel and that he is the prophet of this community. Both Kaidman and Prophet Muhammad then went on to recite poetry composed in their own native languages for their community. So you can see that many of the major points in the two stories are quite similar. So similar that it's hard to believe that they're not connected. Both stories contain a figure who is having a dream in which a visitor appears. A three-step exchange takes place in both versions. First is the command to read or sing, which is responded to by expressing an inability to read or sing. Second, the insistence by the visitor in which the figure asks what they must read or sing. Third, the figure, Muhammad or Kaidman, starts reading or singing. Then we also see them going to a woman, Muhammad's wife Khadija and the abbess of the monastery that Kaidman lives in, who takes him to other learned people who confirm that he's had an angelic vision. The narrative devices are very, very similar. So let's now take a look at the sources for both these stories and see if we can find a connection. Saint Bede, or the Venerable Bede, was an Anglo-Saxon historian and theologian who lived in what is today England. He wrote quite a few things in his life, but for our purposes, the most important is his Ecclesiastical History of the English People, which talks about the history of the English people from around Julius Caesar's arrival in England to roughly his own day in 725 CE or so. He completed this book in 731 and died in 735. Today, the book is known for its contributions to the understanding of how Christianity came to the English Isles. On the other side, we have Muhammad ibn Ishaq. Ibn Ishaq was born in Medina around 704 CE in what is today Saudi Arabia, and he got a religious education from the very beginning. He studied under such illustrious teachers as Muhammad ibn Shihab al-Zuhri. It's said that al-Zuhri was so proud of his student that he remarked that as long as ibn Ishaq was in Medina, 
knowledge would not depart from the city. However, Ibn Ishaq traveled quite a bit around the Islamic Middle East to study in cities such as Alexandria. When Bede died in England in 735, Ibn Ishaq was still a student in Alexandria in his early 30s. He then settled in the city of Baghdad, which was founded by the Abbasid Caliph Al-Mansur in 762. It was here that he wrote the biography of the Prophet of Allah at an unknown time. It's possible that he had been writing it before he got to Baghdad as well, but we simply don't know because the book hasn't survived in its original form. More on that in a minute. Now, Saint Bede gives us no direct sources for where he got his story about Kedmon. That's done and dusted, there's nothing there. However, on Ibn Ishaq's side, we get more information about his story. The story itself, as I have shown here, comes from Al-Tabari's history, which quotes Muhammad Ibn Ishaq's famous Siratul Rasulullah, the biography of the Prophet of Allah. His original book hasn't survived, as I mentioned, but Ibn Ishaq's students quoted large parts of it, so it has been largely reconstructed. Other than Al-Tabari, we have some other versions as well, which are largely the same. So we don't need to worry about all that. All we need to worry about is where Ibn Ishaq got his story. There are two main versions of the story of the first revelation, the Iqra narrative. The version by Ibn Ishaq is actually chronologically the second version. The first version comes from his mentor, Ibn Shihab al-Zuhri. Now what's interesting is that despite being al-Zuhri's student, Ibn Ishaq doesn't actually take his version of the story from his mentor, he takes it from someone else. He heard it from a man named Wahab ibn Qaysan, who was a servant or freedman of the Az-Zubair family. I'll return to the Az-Zubair family in a minute as well. This thing about the same or similar story being recorded by two connected people from multiple sources, but with differences, is very common in Islamic historiography. Ibn Shihab al-Zuhri's version also comes from the Az-Zubair family. His version is quite simple, but similar. The angel appears and then says, read and the rest is similar. However, in this version, the prophet is fully awake. In one version, the prophet seems to have thought that he had gone mad and even thought about throwing himself off the mountain before the angel explained what was going on and the first revelation takes place there. And he seems to be fully awake throughout the incident. Modern scholars believe that these two versions of the story are the oldest to be put into writing. All other versions of the story come from these two, which at least gives us a target to focus on. If the story of Kaidman's call is related to the Iqra narrative, it has to be linked to one of these versions. We're going to disregard Al-Zuhri's version because the narrative tropes simply don't line up well enough to connect it directly to Kaidman's vision. The Prophet isn't asleep in his version, for example, even though the story begins by mentioning that the revelation used to come to the Prophet in the form of a true vision. The story doesn't seem to indicate this. However, that doesn't mean that this version can be completely removed from the equation. Ultimately, it looks like both Az-Zuhri and Ibn Ishaq were working with an earlier version of the story, so Al-Zuhri's version is also somewhat relevant. Let's just focus on Ibn Ishaq's version. I'll remind you again that Ibn Ishaq heard his version of the Iqra narrative from Wahab Ibn Qaysan, a freedman of the Az-Zubair family. Before we move on, let me tell you about the Az-Zubair family. The Az-Zubair family gets its name from Az-Zubair ibn al-Awwam, who was a companion of Prophet Muhammad. He was a very prominent figure in early Islamic politics. He was a nephew of the Prophet Muhammad as well through marriage, as Az-Zubair was the son of Khadija's brother. Khadija was Prophet Muhammad's first wife and the woman mentioned in the Iqra narrative. Az-Zubair was connected by marriage to the Prophet's wife Aisha as well. Aisha's sister, Asma bint Abu Bakr, was married to Az-Zubair. Az-Zubair was hence connected to the Prophet twice, once as a nephew by marriage and once as a brother-in-law. He was also connected to the first caliph, Abu Bakr, who was his father-in-law. Out of Asma and Az-Zubair's children, two are very famous. First, Abdullah ibn Zubair, and second, 
Urwa ibn Zubair. Abdullah was a companion of the Prophet, but he had been a child when the Prophet passed away, maybe younger than 10 or 11 at the time. In fact, parts of the Islamic tradition tell us that Abdullah was the first baby to be born in Medina after the Muslim community moved there from Mecca due to their persecution at the hands of the Meccan polytheists. This made Abdullah the first citizen of the state of Medina by birth. After the death of the Prophet, Abdullah and his father were quite involved in the politics of early Islam. And when the Umayyad dynasty ran into a crisis of succession in 683, Abdullah claimed the caliphate. Looking back, Abdullah isn't often considered the real caliph. Instead, the Umayyads Marwan ibn al-Hakam and Abdul Malik ibn Marwan are seen as legitimate caliphs merely because they won the civil war. However, I don't agree with this. I consider Ibn Zubair to be the real caliph at the time and the Umayyads to be the anti-caliphs. He was defeated and killed in 692 by Umayyad Caliph Abdul Malik ibn Marwan, hence breaking whatever political power the Zubair family still had. Urwa ibn Zubair was Abdullah's younger brother, who was also a political ally. However, after Abdullah's defeat, the Umayyads treated him with respect and allowed him to live out his life in peace, primarily because Urwa was a renowned scholar. Since Urwa was also Asma's son, he was hence Aisha's nephew and had free access to the Prophet's household. Aisha was herself a renowned scholar of Hadith, the sayings and actions of the Prophet. Hence Urwa had access to first-hand accounts about the Prophet. Because of this, he became a very prominent scholar of the Prophet's early biography. The Umayyad Caliphs Abdul Malik and Al-Walid wrote letters to him to ask him about the Prophet's life. These letters form an accidental corpus of the Prophet's biography and are the earliest sources we have on the Prophet. They are considered to be largely but not entirely authentic. Ibn Shihab al-Zuhri studied under Urwa at Medina and later joined the court of the Umayyad Caliphs. Hence, the chain of the students and teachers goes like this. Ibn Ishaq is the student of Al-Zuhri, the student of Urwa, the student of Aisha, the wife of the Prophet Muhammad. Because of this connection to Urwa, the common misconception that the Prophet's biography simply came out of nothing in the 750s is wrong. We have evidence that links the biography of the Prophet to Aisha, who often had second-hand information about the events of the Prophet's life and even was an eyewitness to some events. Hence, the biography that Ibn Ishaq wrote didn't materialize out of nowhere, but was based on earlier traditions. This includes the Iqra narrative. The Iqra narrative itself can be found in Urwa ibn Zubair's codex, but the later reconstructions differ in details. However, the larger narrative structure is the same as mentioned before. That lets us assume that the story in the Islamic world predates the story by Bede given that Urwa passed away around 713 CE, some two decades before Bede wrote his story down. Since Bede doesn't give us any sources for his story, we simply cannot establish if the story existed in England before Bede. Beyond assumption, we do have definitive proof that Muslims had stories about how the revelation occurred. Saint John of Damascus, who passed away in 749, writes that he asked Muslims how their prophet received the Quran and the Muslims said while he was asleep, which clearly shows that Muslims had some traditions of the prophet's first revelation already before Ibn Ishaq ever wrote it down. This is important because none of this is in the Quran, so there certainly were extra Quranic traditions among Muslims at the time. The Venerable Bede never actually discusses Islam in his writings. He mentions the armies of the Saracens, which had broken into Europe, particularly through Spain, but he doesn't comment on their faith, so it's hard to believe that Bede knew a lot about Islam. However, that doesn't mean that the story couldn't have traveled to England. We simply have a lot of evidence that tells us that England and the Muslim Middle East were quite connected. Pilgrims and merchants continued to pour into the Holy Land after the Arab conquest of these lands. We have a second-hand account of a pilgrimage made by Anglo-Saxons to the Holy Land. The pilgrims include Saint Willibald, who was the first known Englishman to visit the Holy Land from 723 to 727. However, the key word here is known, because as the story itself tells us, there were people before them who visited the Holy Land from England. At some point, Willibald and his companions get arrested by Umayyad guards, who take them to their 
boss, perhaps, who interrogates them. When the guy finds out that these people are Anglo-Saxons, he says, I have often seen men coming from those parts of the world, fellow countrymen of theirs. They cause no mischief and are merely anxious to fulfill their law. So this tells us two things. First, that people from England made regular trips to the Holy Land. And second, that there was a time when Brits didn't cause trouble everywhere they went. Other evidence also tells us that there was some infrastructure in place for such ships as well, which would suggest regular travel. We also have physical evidence for the connection between England and the Muslim Middle East. Coins minted by Umayyad Caliph Hisham ibn Abdul Malik have been found all the way in Sussex, England. So clearly money and people were moving around. Interestingly, this coin, famously called Ofa's Dinar, was minted by King Ofa of Mercia around 774 CE. While that's around 50 years after the death of the Venerable Bede, it does still show remarkable Islamic influence as it's an attempt to replicate the gold dinar of the Abbasid Caliph al-Mansur. It might have been made to trade with Muslims and is actually rife with errors, probably because the craftsmen who made it weren't familiar with the Arabic and maybe were just trying to copy the writing symbol. Another problem with assuming that Bede's version somehow reached the Middle East and was copied by Ibn Ishaq or al-Zuhri is that Latin to Arabic translations are very, very rare at this point in history. It would be remarkable for a number of reasons, such as the fact that someone who spoke Latin and lived in the Middle East, probably Syria or Palestine, took a book about the history of England and translated it into Arabic within 20 to 30 years of the book's publication. This just seems very far-fetched. Part of the reason for that is that Latin had largely gone out of the Middle East by the year 700. Greek had replaced it in the Byzantine Empire's territories and local languages such as Syriac were used more than Latin. So ultimately, what happened? What's the reason behind the similarity of these two stories? What seems quite likely is that there was a story in the Muslim Middle East with these narrative tropes and major points. Cademan's call and the Iqra narrative both ultimately derive from it. This narrative device of a voice calling out to read or recite something and also sleeping people having visions and dreams aren't all that uncommon in the Bible. In fact, the wording used by Ibn Ishaq in Arabic is itself found in the Bible. When the angel appears, he says to Prophet Muhammad, Iqra, meaning recite or read, and the Prophet says, Ma'aqra, meaning I cannot read, or what should I read? In Isaiah 46, we find a similar exchange, and the wording in Hebrew is very similar. A voice calls out, Iqra, to which the reply is, Ma'aqra. Of course, the Arabic and the Hebrew languages are related, so it's not surprising to find similar wording in the Hebrew Bible and in Islamic sources, even the Quran. In his book, Muhammad and the Empires of Faith, Sean W. Anthony gives examples of extra-biblical stories as well that follow similar themes. He writes, Yet, even if biblical archetypes can be proven to be insufficient to explain these commonalities between the two narratives, are we, therefore, forced to conclude that the two narratives are directly interrelated? Perhaps not. By focusing too closely on the Bible, scholars have overlooked other important literary genres, not to mention the broader literary production of late antiquity. It is prima facie just as possible that the story of Cademan's call and the Iqra narrative rely on a hitherto unidentified common source rather than being directly related. Visitations by otherworldly figures are, after all, not rare occurrences in world literature. No less so in stories of holy persons of late antiquity. Can one not cite other stories that are similarly structured to those of the call of Cademan and the call of Muhammad? Certainly one can. A few examples illustrate this point. According to the geographer Pausanias, for instance, the Greek dramatist Aeschylus likewise acquired his ability to compose tragedies after the god Dionysus appeared to him in a dream as he slept in a vineyard. 
The Shepherd of Hermas, a 2nd century Christian treatise, also recounts a series of revelatory visions experienced by its protagonist, Hermas, who saw apparitions of supernatural visitors in his sleep. One of these visitors even brings him a book he cannot decipher until granted divine aid. Even Abul Faraj al-Isfahani, the great anthologist of Arabic verse, recounts a story that follows this model in which the famed pre-Islamic Arabian poet Abid ibn al-Abras purportedly only began to compose Arabic verse after a preternatural figure appeared to him in a dream and granted him the gift of poetry in answer to his prayers. We have other stories of people being handed tablets or scrolls by heavenly visitors. A lot of these stories were written in Syria or Palestine or Egypt, and Muslims were actively absorbing traditions from these areas to craft a general structure for their own stories and traditions. The story of the sleepers of Ephesus, for example, is a Christian story that doesn't come from the Bible, but finds its way into the Quran where there's a chapter named after them. That story first appeared in Syriac sources and quickly spread throughout the Middle East and the Christian world. So, to summarize, we have four possibilities. First, that Saint Bede plagiarized Ibn Ishaq's work. Now, this is impossible, of course. I shouldn't have even called it a possibility because Saint Bede's work predates Ibn Ishaq's work by at least two decades. Second, that Ibn Ishaq plagiarized Bede's work. This is very, very unlikely, given that this would mean that Bede's book came to the Middle East where someone translated it from Latin into Arabic. This would assume someone interested in the history of the English people enough to undertake such a task who spoke Arabic and had an Arabic audience interested in the subject matter to warrant an Arabic translation. Third, the similarities are merely a coincidence. This one is very difficult to believe when you put the narratives next to each other. They're way too similar for it to be merely a coincidence. However, as we have seen, similar tropes certainly existed in Middle Eastern storytelling, and hence it's certainly a possibility that the Iqra narrative and Cademan's call were coincidentally following the same tropes, but it's quite improbable when you look at both stories. Fourth and final one is that both Ibn Ishaq and the Venerable Bede were drawing from the same sources, or at least sources that were connected. This makes the most sense because it would likely be a Christian source, and so there would be interest enough in the source for it to be taken to England by one of the many pilgrims who came to the Holy Land. It would also be common enough in the Middle East, since it would likely have been composed in Syria or Palestine, for it to reach Muslim ears. In this case, the story would have to have existed by around 650 or so, because the story can reliably be traced to Urwa ibn Zubair, who spent most of his life in Medina. So by around 650 or so, the story should have reached Medina. This means that the story could have even existed in the greater Middle East, during the Prophet's lifetime. Imagine a story that exists independent of Prophet Muhammad during his lifetime that's later appropriated for him. It's quite an interesting possibility. At the end of the day, this whole story shows us that nothing exists in a vacuum and the world is and always has been extremely connected. It also sheds some light on the origins of parts of the Islamic tradition. A lot of the Quran, for example, repeats tropes from things that came before, like the Bible and extra-biblical Christian sources, and even pre-Islamic Arabic poetry and folklore. See you next time. Don't forget to subscribe and press the bell icon. On the screen right now, you can see the names and tiers of the patrons. You can join them by pledging a dollar or more to support the channel. Thank you for watching.